This podcast is brought to you by the North Dakota Petroleum Foundation. From heating our homes and powering our vehicles to cell phones, clothing, and medical equipment, oil and natural gas makes everyday life better. North Dakota Oil and Natural Gas, advancing the possibilities. Learn more at ndpetroleumfoundation.org. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Rob Port. Welcome to another episode of Plain Talk Live. Minnesota, for a lot of reasons that I probably don't need to inform you of, has become an epicenter in the debate over uh, the use of law enforcement, use of force by law enforcement. And obviously, this is a national debate, but as we just saw with the George Floyd situation, the Derek Chauvin trial, some other incidents, Minnesota is an epicenter. We'll, we'll put it that way. Um, as a result, the state of Minnesota has passed some new laws pertaining to the use of force by law enforcement. And critical of those laws is, well, some members of North Dakota, North Dakota law enforcement, specifically members of North Dakota law enforcement who work along North Dakota's border with the state of Minnesota. Cass County Sheriff Jesse Johnner has written a letter to Minnesota Governor uh, Tim Walls, and in his letter, he... Uh, well, not only points out what he perceives to be some problems with Minnesota's law, but also asks for an exemption for them from them for North Dakota law enforcement that at times, uh, under long-standing agreements and, and practice, at times North Dakota law enforcement crosses the border into Minnesota to, to render assistance to Minnesota law enforcement. Um, from his letter, and I'm, I'm reading here, he posted the letter on Facebook. I'm going to read some excerpts from it. He writes, I quote, the Cass County Sheriff's Office and our North Dakota partner agencies were notified of a recent change to Minnesota statute, and here he cites the statute, governing use of force. It presumes guilt of an officer using deadly force unless the officer provides and the court accepts a statement covering a three-part test documenting the necessity of deadly force. The three-part test is subject to interpretation and does not appear to reflect basic due process protections included in the Fifth and Sixth Amendments to the U.S. Constitution, including compelling government to produce witnesses and evidence to prove the alleged crime and not compelling a defendant, here a police officer, to be a witness against themselves. Uh, he continues, to expect a North Dakota peace officer to react differently to an imminent threat of life when the application sometimes has to be applied in seconds, when on a day-to-day -day basis they're applying North Dakota law, is not a fair expectation. In my experience as a trainer, this will cause someone to get hurt. The letter continues. I am respectfully asking that an amendment could be made to your statute that allows North Dakota law enforcement officers who respond into Minnesota to fall under their policy and procedures and state guidelines on use of force and deadly force as it is written in the North Dakota Century Code. Joining me now is Sheriff uh, Jesse Johnner. Sheriff Johnner, how are you? I'm doing well, Rob. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for your time. I, I appreciate it as well. Um, so, so tell us about obviously what what, what prompted you to to write this letter. I mean, I guess it's pretty self evident, but but tell <laughs> us how this came to your attention and how you came to learn about this change in law. Sure. Well, actually, it was pretty short notice, which is uh, some of the some of the parts of the concern w with it and how the how the law was um, sent out. So. As you, as you stated in your opening remarks there, or comments, um, we do work regularly with our Clay County partners, the, that being the Clay County Sheriff's Office and the Moorhead Police Department. And not only in critical situations, but on a day-to-day -day basis, we share several resources with them. We, we have a bunch of different types of uh, smaller entities within our organizations that work as far as um, task forces and things like that. So we have the Metro Area Street Crimes Task Force. We have our Narcotics um, Joint Task Force. We have SWAT, which encompasses tactical um, bomb and negotiations. And so on a regular basis, uh, because we're so close to each other, we're working back and forth and sharing resources, whether that be equipment or officers. And so this new law change came when it came out. It came out fairly quickly. We didn't have much of a um, lead time on it, so to speak. Uh, it just all of a sudden we were informed that the law was changing and that, of course, caused some concerns for us because, number one, uh, we, we weren't sure what the, what, what the law was at that time. And so we needed to make a good interpretation of it to make sure we are interpreting, interpreting it um, accordingly. 
And then, of course, we needed to look and see, is it possible or feasible for us to train our officers on the change um, and be able to do it safely for the citizens that we serve, the suspects that we encounter, and then also law enforcement in general. How often does, I mean, because it, it seems to me there you're expressing two primary arguments in, in your letter. First is that the law itself puts law enforcement officers in sort of a, a guilty until proven innocent situation. If they use force, they then have to justify the use of force. Otherwise, they're they're culpable on, under the law. Um, and and two, that it's it's difficult for North Dakota law enforcement to to operate under use of force laws that are one way in North Dakota and a different way in Minnesota when often your jobs require you to cross the border. So I, I guess first, how, how often, how often does it happen that, that North Dakota, and, and again, you're, it's obviously your, your department, you know, that's, um, you know, Cass County, but then there's, there's Fargo police, West Fargo police, uh, there's Clay County or officers and, and Moorhead, you know, you're operating in the Fargo Moorhead area that are crossing in, into North Dakota. How often does that happen? I mean, is that like an everyday thing? Yeah, so a couple of things, if I could kind of go back and ask, answer, or uh, respond to your first oh, uh, sure. comments there. And that, that is, um, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that we understand or that the point gets across that I, I, I don't by any means um, think that we should not have to justify any applications of force um, and up to deadly force. Uh, that is something that all law enforcement officers should be able to do if they're going to apply that type of force. So I want to make sure that we're we're talking the same. We're on the same page there. Um, this part, the way that this law is particularly written, um, there's a three-part test to kind of work through as you as you justify that, and um, you know that when when you're when you're not training with it all the time, can cause some sort of a, you know cause an issue because officers are trying to make those uh, split-second decisions oftentimes in these types of situations, and typically they're going to divert back to how they were trained. So, but but to answer your question, we go back and forth between uh, the the two cities regularly. It's daily um, with all those uh, task force and stuff that we're that we're all a part of. So that happens daily. Um, is, it, is, it, to, is it currently happening, or is that on pause now with this? Yep. So we we've currently paused that for right now. Um, we do not have anyone going over there. And when I say we, the Cass County Sheriff's Office, Fargo Police Department, and West Fargo Police Department. So, but when we talk about training and trying to train uh the changes that's where this becomes a little little uh tricky so to speak and that is we've we've got north dakota officers who train under one set of guidelines they're doing it daily they've done it for several years um minnesota's law prior to this change was very similar because it's all you know kind of fa falls under the federal guideline of graham versus connor tennessee versus um garner and scott versus harris those are kind of the main uh, Supreme Court case laws that govern the applications of force by law enforcement. And so prior to this Minnesota change, um, you know, they were very similar to North Dakota. So uh, when, when we were training our officers in North Dakota to follow our policy procedures, guidelines, and, and use of force applications uh, through the Century Code, I mean, we've trained on that for several years. And oftentimes, in my experience as a trainer, and I've had an opportunity to train a number of officers in intense situations, um, People divert back to how they were trained when the, when the adrenaline is going on. They have, you know, just a few seconds to react. They divert back to how they were training. And so now if we send officers over into Minnesota and there's a different set of guidelines, we have to, um, you know, think in our mind, hey, are they going to respond appropriately? Are they going to respond uh, the way they were trained in North Dakota? Or, you know, if we try to train them in the Minnesota law, are they going to, you know, adjust to that? Um, training and that application of force when they only have an, a seconds to do that. And that's where people can start to become hurt because if you have pauses by law enforcement um, or they're interpreting in, in, incorrectly, um, they might, you know, might, might choose the wrong use of force. So it's, uh, it becomes very, very complicated. And so simply I was just asking the governor if we could make an amendment to their current law right now until we can get some of these figure, these things figured out because we really do um, want to go over and help our Clay County partners in this pause that we're that we're experiencing right now. It's 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 daily, of course, and we feel like we're leaving them hanging. Do you feel like the Minnesota changes are good policy from a law enforcement perspective? 
they, you know what, there, there are some things in the, in the law change, I think that are, that are beneficial. Um, but I do think that, uh, it, some of the, the law changes were, um, maybe made without thinking through a number of different situations. I realize that in law enforcement, there's a number of situations that we encounter daily and to simply bring all of those in front of a, a legislative commission and say, what about this, that, or the other would be very difficult. Um, but as the laws come out and we've looked at those and we've asked those questions, what about this scenario? What about that scenario? The, the main problem with it is that we don't get a clear answer. There's too much to interpretation. Um, you know, the state's attorney or whoever we were talking to when we asked those questions would say, well, you know, I'm not sure. We, we don't know at this time. Can and you so give that, us some, that's the problem. Can you give us some specific examples? Like, like what are we talking about specifically? Well, there's, there's this three part test, obviously that needs to be, um, conducted. Uh, that that's one of the, the pieces. And so, um, and then there's, there's some keywords that were taken out of the, the, uh, the previous deadly force statute. Uh, words such as apparent, um, and and so w when you have uh, when you're working through situations and you have to think in your mind and work through this three-part test, um, that's going to obviously take a few seconds longer than you would typically uh, respond instinctively, and of course that's where the training piece comes in. Um, but there's things you know uh, where where it needs to be an, an, an apparent threat, and sometimes that's not always um, able to be able to be defined as things are rapidly evolving. Okay. So that would be one. And, and we could really get into the weeds and, and talk some, some law and stuff, law, um, interpretations here, which would encompass a lot of time, but there, it's, that's mostly the, the, uh, the change that, that concerns me is the apparent and perceived threats, uh, that an officer may come across and having to work through that three part test. And then, uh, you know, this, it mostly presumes, perceive, presumes, excuse me, that the officer would be guilty until they were able to be proven innocent. So, which is different than what uh, a normal person would experience through our through our court system, where they're innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, so. and that's and that's. I mean, if we were talking maybe strictly in an administrative sense, maybe that's one thing. But uh, we're we're living in an environment where police officers are are being charged with crimes and and not not always unreasonably i mean not always not always obviously inappropriately um but but if a law enforcement i mean this this has implications not we're not just talking about the reputation of a given law enforcement department we're talking about at times specific criminal liability of the individual officer and so to put them in a situation where they use force which the taxpayers provide law enforcement officers with guns and with authority to use force in, in uh, and we all acknowledge that there are times when law enforcement has to use regrettably i don't think anybody likes it but regrettably has to use force um and we all understand that but now we're putting law enforcement i, I guess i have a problem with that we're putting law enforcement in a position we're saying well you use the force that that we've explicitly authorized you to use um you used the tools of force that we specifically paid for you to have uh, but now if you use them, now you have to justify yourself or you have to prove that you pr use them appropriately. Otherwise, you're guilty and maybe even criminally guilty, which could be fines and jail time. Um, that seems very problematic to me. Yeah. And the, one thing that I really want to get across here, Rob, I think that's important is in, in my opinion, um, the way the, ro the law was written previously, there were, you know, I didn't feel that there were issues with that. Again, it was very similar to how our law is written in North Dakota. It's really, the problem comes in is, is how that officer is applying that law and that force, okay? It, it's really not how the law is written. It's how is that officer applying that law and how are they applying the force? That's where the issues come in, right? So, and that that's, that's kind of my whole point behind it um, in making some of these changes. And some of these changes are sometimes spurred by um, emotions and things that happen and no doubt um, that some of the some of these things were probably thought of after the George Floyd incident and and and, and I'll be honest about the George Floyd incident I mean I do it initially um, you know do I think that the the officer uh, Mr. Chauvin was was wrong at the end piece of that application of force yes I mean once that once uh, Mr. Floyd had stopped resisting then there should have been a reassessment 
on that application of force and then the force should stop and and that's going to be different from agency to agency and how they view that but no doubt in my mind we have job as a law enforcement officer that once we apply that force to continually do a reassessment on you know whether that person's okay or not after the situation has settled down and that resistance has stopped so you uh you, the your letter is dated april 19th uh so we're a little bit a little bit more than a week since you you sent it to to governor walls have you received any sort of a response yet i received an initial response because i didn't directly send it to governor walls um when i was reaching out and trying to figure out how how to get him the the letter the information um, I was given another individual's name uh, that has regular contact with him and probably, you know, is the person that gets a number of emails from from the public and then forwards them on to him. And I did receive a response back from that person saying that they had received my letter and that they had forwarded on to Governor Walls at that time. So so as far as you know, the governor has received it or is going to receive it. And then at this point, just waiting for have you spoken with because obviously you're you're an elected official in Cass County, an elected law enforcement official. Have you spoken with Governor Burgum uh, about this at all? Uh, you know, to, to maybe have, you know, obviously uh, where he could maybe open up a dialogue with his counterpart over in Minnesota about this? Because I got to think this doesn't just affect, we have a lot of communities. I mean, we have Wapiton, Breckenridge, we have Grand Forks, East Grand Forks. Um, you know, we, we have, we share a lot of border with Minnesota. Uh, it can't just be your communities that are dealing with this. Have, have you spoken with Governor Burgum's office at all? I actually haven't, but in, in my conversations with other law enforcement, as, as we're kind of working through this situation, I was in, I've been notified by a few different people that he was aware of it and that he had reached out to Governor Walls. That's um, what I heard secondhand. So speculation, of course, on my part, I haven't spoken with him directly. But from my understanding, there has been a conversation with him and Governor Walls. I don't know the extent of that or you know if he was answered by Governor, Governor Walls. But that's what I understand. Do you think do you think you, you should have uh, routed this through like Governor Burgum first or, or something like that so that North Dakota could speak with a, a united voice on that? Yeah, you know, that that might not have been a, a, a bad idea. Again, I was taking that on speculation, Rob, um, and, and hearing that he he had, um, you know, certainly that would probably be my next option if I don't hear back from Governor Walls, um, you know, to, to reach out to the governor and see if he has had any any luck in, in speaking with him. Would you expect the, the, the current pause to, to remain in place indefinitely if, if you don't hear back from um, from Governor Walls or if Governor Walls comes back and says, no, I'm sorry, you know, the law is the law and, and, and if you're going to cross the border, you have to follow it. Um, I mean, if that's the message, does, does the pause stay in place then or is there, do you then come back and say, okay, well, now we've got to do some additional training so we can get back to that cross-border relationship that we had? Sure. So, you know, first of all, I'm, I'm hoping that he that he does consider it and that we're able to go this route. But very much like you said, it's a possibility that that's not going to happen. And so uh, for right now, we you know, we would not go over there until we could look at um, doing the training and then not only doing the training, because I think that in order to train this, uh, again, in my experience would be to uh, we, we've done the the interpretation as far as when I say we law enforcement uh, leaders in this area, we've looked at it. And we were like, OK, how you know, what changes would we have to make to 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 make this work? And so when we looked at it, we're like, OK, we did the interpretation. We've got the interpretation now. Is it feasible to go back and train our officers? Um, and, and, you know, there's been some talk of, well, they could do video training. Well, my my opinion, that's not enough to watch a video when you're uh, talking about applying force to someone and possibly even having to take someone's life, uh, watching a video is not appropriate or reasonable in, in my opinion. So watching a video um, and then after that, training the change, and then after that, doing scenario-based training, because oftentimes in order for people to respond instinctively, you have to have a number of repetitions so that it's ingrained into that person's muscle memory. And then we would want to put people through scenario based situations to put them in um, to a, a situation where they had to make a decision on how they were going to respond so we could gauge it to see if the training was effective. So, you know, we're talking the Cass County Sheriff's Office has 130 licensed law enforcement officers. 
Um, we're talking several hours here for each aid, for each officer to make this change. And so, and then to even see if it would, if, you know, if officers could perceive those changes in seconds. And so I don't even know if it's possible to, to make the training change. In my opinion, it would take several months, maybe even years to, to do that. And so, yeah, I mean, we're definitely looking at a long pause here if we can't make this exception or amendment that I've asked for, which I thought would be uh, more practical and less chance that people yeah. would get hurt. It, so. it, it makes sense. I mean, because I, I can't imagine there's a more consequential part of your job than, than use of force. I mean, if you end up being put in a situation to use force on a member of the public, I, I mean, one, I mean, you've, you've changed the member of that. I mean, if, if they're if they end their life, obviously, but but even even if, if you don't end their life, if they have that sort of an interaction with law enforcement, that's a landmark event in the average citizen's life. Right. I mean, they're that's a that's a big, big deal to them. So so the training that goes into around that for law enforcement has to be exacting, which, which is what you're talking about. But but how do you handle it? I mean, and I guess I don't know. I mean, how is, is, is Minnesota the only state in the nation that has something like this? I, I know, you know, just, just from my years of, of writing about, I, I know a lot of law enforcement agencies come to our, or law enforcement um, um, personnel come to our state from other states or other parts of the country where maybe they were law enforcement there first, and then they come, they come here and they're law enforcement I mean, how often, how, how different are our laws from other states? I mean, how much training goes into that? Sure. Well, you know, we're, we're kind of going down that road specifically of use of force and deadly force. But obviously, there's other laws um, that are different between sure, states, right. as, as you know, Rob. Um, I'm only familiar right now with the states of California and Minnesota where they've changed their deadly force and use of force statutes um, that are pretty much different than the national standard. Uh, could there be a, some other states there might be? I'm only familiar with those two right now. Um, so, and, and like I said, I mean, there's uh, officers that come here from different parts of the country but um, and work, but mo the majority of those that are coming here, it is very similar, the state that they came from, um, to our application of force and, and deadly force. Because, again, uh, most of that is governed under federal uh, standards right now and statutes. Again, the biggest one being Graham B. Connor, um, Scott B. Harris, Tennessee B. Con Garner. So those are some of the main case, case federal Supreme Court case laws that we most law enforcement follows when they're when they're going down that road of using force. Do you feel like anything needs to change with North Dakota's use? Of, I mean, and, and again, obviously, there's there's all sorts of law that but but talking specifically about use of force. Is there anything that needs? And I, I, I think you kind of answered this earlier when you said you felt like the existing law was fine. But do you think there's I mean, because, again, we're, we're obviously we're having uh, and, and we've been having a national debate about the relationship between law enforcement and the communities that law enforcement works in. D does anything need to change with North Dakota's laws? Or, or even just with, with, for instance, your department's internal policies? You know, I, I feel like, again, that our, our uh, use of force, application of force laws in North Dakota are, are, are pretty sufficient. Again, they follow the federal guidelines. Sometimes you have to make some tweaks to that based on, um, and that's where uh, Graham versus Connor comes in So as, as being such an important um Supreme Court case law because that takes in the totality of the circumstances and what I'm getting at with that is uh, Applications of force come down to the area that you work in right uh, the resources available to that officer whether that's um, personnel or equipment and fi and financial pieces to that law enforcement agency so what I'm getting at with that is not every agency might have the financial means to to purchase a number of different less than lethal options those things aren't cheap um, and so they might be limited on what they're able to pur purchase as far as less than lethal options. Um, they might be somewhat re restricted as far as um, if they're more of a rural agency than, um, you know, like the Fargo Police Department or West Fargo, where backup's going to be a little bit quicker to get to them, right? Uh, you might have officers that are patrolling in rural areas where their closest backup is 40 to 50 miles away. Um, and so then they have to resort to different levels of force. So. Um, I, a standardized use of force can't fit every um, circumstances based on those those things that I mentioned. And so that's where the standardized piece becomes kind of 
somewhat um, uh, conflictual, maybe, if you want to say that, because again, it, it really depends on, you know, what works in North Dakota might not work in, in California based on the area. And so that's why Graham v. Connor to me is such an important uh, Supreme Court case law because it takes in the totality of the circumstances, you know, the severity of the crime, the resistance from that person. What what do the officers know at the time? You know, is that area, uh, is it a dangerous place to police on, at, you know, from day to day? And, you know, the size of the officer, the the equipment available to the officer, the, um, the other officers in the immediate area, what did they know? So there's just so many factors that come into play when the application of force is, is applied. And I, and I think that, again, there's one standard you apply to one area might not work in another. How, how do we get back to a place where, um, and, and, and zooming out just a little bit, I mean, obviously use of force is, is central to the debate, but zooming out a little bit, I mean, obviously when, when law enforcement uses force, you know, you want to be able to come out and say we used it appropriately and it was justified. Sure. Um, and, and there's 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 a lot of mistrust between some people. I mean, there's people marching in the street who are saying we don't when, when law enforcement uses force, we don't trust them to necessarily use it appropriately. What are the what are some things you, you feel like law enforcement could do to make it um easier for the public to trust again that when because, again, sometimes law force is absolutely justified. That's beyond a doubt. Um, so that when law enforcement uses force, the public can trust that it was used appropriately. And I can tell you one thing. I, I know in past, law enforcement was very, very slow in getting things like photos or videos out to the public. I feel like that's starting to change where those videos are getting released faster. I think that really helps so that, uh, you know, we could, we could go and we, instead of relying on eyewitness accounts, which can be fallible for various reasons – um, we can have, you know, basically an objective view, if not always, unfortunately, a complete view. Um, I think that's one thing that's helped. But are, are there some other things you see that, that could help rebuild that trust? Yes. And, and that's an excellent uh, question, Rob. I think, number one, we have to have the trust of the public to be successful law enforcement organizations. Right. And I think um, a way to do that is, number one, transparency and education. Those are the two biggest things. And so. Um, I'm going to go down the road more specifically with our agency because, you know, I we're trying to put things into play to do very much like like what you're what you're referring to. And so I think the biggest thing is, number one, education. Um, and, and what, what does that mean? Edu educate like yep. education for, for your office or your deputies, education for the public, both. What, what does that mean? Yeah, ed Education for the public and education for the media and, and the things that I'm talking about um, that we need to educate people on is uh, use of force. Um, you know, why is it, why it's applied, when it's applied, the types of equipment that we use to apply force, um, educating people on a taser, how it works, um, target zones, um, OC spray. Okay. Recently we purchased a device called the Bola wrap, Bola remote restraint wrap, which is a device that is deployed from, from your, your hand that can, can restrain a person by wrapping them with an eight, eight uh, foot tethered rope. Okay. So Educating people on on why force is used, how it's used, the types of tools that we use to apply force, um, those those things are big. Uh, and then the transparency issue, um, you know, for us, we have anytime that a force is applied in our our agency, we have a review of that use of force through a review board that we have within inside our organization. And, and those individuals that make up the review board are our trainers, and they make sure that the train that the application of force follows policy procedures and guidelines within our own uh, policies, and then that it also followed state law and federal law. And um, once, the, once that's investigated, those findings are brought forward. That review board looks at it and makes sure that it was reasonable and appropriate under uh, that Graham versus Connor um, case law that I mentioned to you. And then it comes up after that goes through that review, review board, it comes up to me. And then I, I look at it, I get my a final set of eyes on it. And then once those investigations are complete, that stuff is fully transparent to our public. Our public can come in, they can look at that, they can re review those things. We have an Office of Professional Standards uh, where people make complaints to our agency, same process. It's investigated by one of our investigators. Um, they gather all the information. If there's video footage, statements from the officer, statements from the, the person who's making the complaint. 
And then that, that goes through that process, those findings, that investigator is strictly a fact finder and they bring that to me. I look at it and then I, I determine if the complaint's going to be sustained, um, you know, or, or, or not sustained. And then that becomes public record and people can come in and look at that. So transparency is huge in those issues. Uh, we recently, recently purchased body cameras. I was going to ask. Yeah. And, yeah. and so um, that brings a whole nother level of transparency to, to our agency where, you know, upon completion of those cases, people can look at that if they have questions on it. Um, and then I, I mentioned that Bola re remote restraint ramp system. We've recently started our 11 week uh, citizens Academy. Um, that's very important to our agency where people can come in, you could come in and you can every week for one night for three hours, you, you spend time with us here and you, you look at different parts of our organization. You know, one night it might be SWAM, SWAT negotiations and bomb and those individuals come in and talk to you about how those things work. They show you equipment, um, what they do. Uh, it just, it, it looks at all aspects of our agency. We recently started that again and we openly invite people to come in and learn about our organization and policy and procedures. We have an adopted community program that we that we take um, very seriously at our at the sheriff's office here and where each deputy in our agency works with one rural community that doesn't have a police department. And so they go to their city council meetings and they do education there on the calls for service that they have monthly, the new equipment that we're getting how they can work better with our citizens to work on issues in their community. Um, that gives that deputy an opportunity to learn um, and to be introduced to people in that community. So, you know, if there's, if there's um, cultural differences, ethnicities, different things like that, um, they, they can work with those different uh, groups to, so that we can all understand that and bring that training back to our organization and educate the rest of our deputies on, on diff, you know, different ways that we would respond when, when, when we're dealing with situations with those types of groups. So um, we do a number of things. Actually, I just worked on a letter earlier here, Rob, that I'm going to put out on our Facebook that gives uh, a good example of the things that we're trying to do and be forward thinking and trying to, to evolve with the changes that are being expected now with our citizens from our communities and how we can do things better. And we're always going to look for that. We want to look for ways that we can safer, safely interact with our, with our community and, and understand. But one thing that I do would lastly like, like to get out here is a number of these things are occurring because people are resisting law enforcement. And when people resist law enforcement, that's when force has to be applied. And, and so, you know, I really ask people that, hey, if, if you have contact with a law enforcement officer, just just follow what they're asking you to do, comply with that. And, um, you know, in the long run, if you think something was was done wrongly as far as you being arrested for something, we have a court procedure for that. And then we can follow through um, you know, with that after, but at the time when the officer is confronting you is not a good time to resist because then that's when force has to be applied. And anytime that force has to be applied, there's an opportunity for someone to get hurt. So, um, you know, a number of different things like that. Uh, last question. Do you feel like, cause sometimes it seems like when we have these debates, the answer is always, well, more training, more training, more training. I mean, at some point we're dealing with human beings that are out on the field and obviously, I mean, when you have to make decisions and in, in, in snap decisions in the heat of the moment, I can understand you, you fall back on training, right? Because you almost you almost want to be able to do the right thing without even having to think about it because you've been trained. But there also comes a point where the policy has to be something that a human being can follow in the moment, right? And I'm I'm thinking uh, it's it's uh, your your point here about there being two different, you know, it's like you know, off, deputy has to be thinking, okay, well I've crossed into Minnesota now. Now I've got a different set of rules that I have to play by. Boy, that would be tough. Um, I, do you worry sometimes that we're getting to a point where we're just asking, there's there's too many laws and too many regulations. We're just asking too much of law enforcement. I don't know if I'm, I don't that, know if I, I don't know if I'm yeah. wording that the right way, but that yeah, what I'm no, trying to say is definite. at the end of the you're day, th these are human beings. You know, I'm thinking like if I <laughs> I'm thinking of like all the style guide stuff that I have to follow when I'm writing a column, and that's not even. In the, it's just me sitting at my desk, right? I mean, it's sometimes it gets to be a lot. Yep, you're definitely right, right on the mark there, um, Rob. If we start throwing too many things in the mix and people have to think through too many things, much like you said, people are human. Um, just because we're law enforcement doesn't give us a different human aspect. Everyone, you know, and, and training is a big portion of that. But yeah, I mean, if we have a bunch of different standards and guidelines and and tools and things like that, that's where where people start making mistakes. Uh, when they have to think through those things um, very quickly. And so, 
Um, you know, some some standardization in, in some of those practices is good. Again, I mentioned earlier that what works here might not work in California, but some standardization is is good. And if if we can find something that works good for everyone to keep our community safe, our interactions safer, um, and just everyone safe in general, that would that would be ideal. And then not to have to have all these different set of guidelines. Um, and and then not only that, not only does it make it easier for the officer, but it could also make it easier for the citizen, right? Because they now they know. Um, based on everything being standardized, how they should respond or how they should interact with law enforcement and what to expect because it's not different yeah. in this area than what it is here, right? And that's where some of the confusion comes in as well. It's not just for the officer. It might be for the citizen or the person that's having that interaction with law enforcement. Well, and that's, I could get on a whole other rant about how many laws we have on the books and how that confuses the public and they're trying to follow the law, but you don't know what the law is because the law is super confusing. Um, but that's probably a topic for a whole other show. Sheriff Johnner, I know you're a busy man. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Yep. Thanks for having me on, Rob. I always appreciate the opportunity to get some education out. And and if anyone has any questions after watching this, they want to talk to me directly. I'm always open for good discussions and, and input and ways that we can do things better.